All right, take it away. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so what were those topics again? Uh, I believe the topics are, well, free, uh, let's ask Dan what he'd like to discuss this meeting, uh, if he has anything in particular, uh, and then uh, Yulia, Yulia's topic on uh, invariance and Alex's topic on reviewing, uh, reviewing uh, proposals. Excellent. Okay. Dan. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I know it's a late latest for Yulia, so I think it would make a lot of sense to start with her. Um, okay. Yulia. Right. I seem to be looking at the wrong agenda because I can't find Dan's topic. But uh, I had posted uh, on the agenda a, a link to the repository that I made. Um, and I'll just post it in the chat here uh, so that if anyone hasn't seen it listed on the uh, message board, you can find it here. I summarized our discussion from last week here and uh, sort of sketched out a uh, shape for this. And I also listed the uh, abandoned, uh, I created two files, abandoned invariance and known invariance, just around what we discussed. In the abandoned invariance, I added uh, the one that Mark mentioned. Um, and uh, I didn't catch all of the detail there, so that's something that'll need to be clarified a bit. I just gave everything a little bit of shape. Uh, and in known invariance, I don't have anything yet because I was looking forward to this meeting as a chance for us to discuss known invariance. And what we can do is I can just listen and write them down, uh, tag people with, the, um, uh, with checking the invariance to make sure that they've been accurately recorded. And then ideally, I would like to present this at committee at the upcoming meeting so that um, we can collect more of them and discuss them at greater depth. Uh, how does that sound? Sounds good. Okay. So uh, to, to, to kick this off, I want to bring up a comment from Jordan. Maybe I'll share my screen and then it will be easier for everybody. Um, share. Okay, so um, I have here the uh, abandoned invariance. I don't know if you can see that. Yep. Do you see my whole screen or just the browser? Whole screen. Whole screen. Okay, so I'll, I'll be careful with what I show. Uh, yeah, okay. I screwed up on that, especially while the meeting is being recorded, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, F11. <laughs> F11, is that a way? Oh, I view, have a Mac. There's no- View, view full screen. <laughs> It'll be fine. Um, okay, so here we have abandoned invariance and I have a template. I use this consistently for all of them and we can modify this template. This is just the thing that I came up with alone. It'll change. Um, and the first one that we have to test this out is the type of behavior between uh, loose equality and strict equality. Uh, the description I've written down is if the result of type of, of A and B were the same, the result of uh, loose equality and strict equality should be the same. This was relaxed with value types. This description I got from the notes, but I don't know if it was accurately recorded. Uh, does that sound right? I would refine it a little bit. Um, the, uh, when you say it was relaxed with value types, Mm -hmm. We don't have value types yet. We, the value types is anticipated, um, uh, and uh, the um, uh, and there's also this other operator overloading proposal um, that was done that uh, also from Dan uh, Dan Ehrenberg um, uh, that he did in response to despairing about whether we could get value types. Uh, both of those uh, relax. Um, uh, this invariant, um, uh, but, both, so both of the, but both of those haven't happened yet. So far, uh, we have that invariant. Uh, this is on specification details. Uh, it was important in the ES5 discussions. Okay. So I'm going to rename this to loose invariance. Uh, important in ES5 discussions, so I got that uh, one. I would actually keep it abandoned and just okay. because it's it's 
we're the, the, the thing that's important about it is it's, it's that we're considering abandoning it. Right. Um, there's no, loose means, loose sounds like it's approximate. It's not approximate, it's a cliff. Could I title this potentially abandoned? Sure. So okay. we do have what some people have considered uh, invariants that we've broken. Um, okay. I don't know if that's the same because we never agreed that they were invariants, which is part of the reasoning here. Uh, script concatenation uh, mm -hmm. can always start with a comment and it will not affect uh, things. The hash bang grammar changed that. There was, there was uh, argument on if we should allow uh, comments in front of hash bang after we landed that change. Yeah, I, I would say that that is an example of an abandoned invariant. Uh, you know, it, 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 it was an invariant in the sense that it was a regularity that the spec obeyed. The fact that we argued about it meant that, some, that, that we were aware of it and that some people were in favor of it. Um, so it was a, an invariant that, we, that, the, that was a property of the spec that we decided to, to abandon. Particularly, it's script concatenation can always have a comment added to it at the start without effect. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's no longer true. Okay. Yeah. Suggestion, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, I think it might be wise to have a uh, section in your templates for where these uh, invariants existed and in what version of the specification. You have it partly in specification details, but I'm, I'm talking about a specific uh, reference. It was here in this no, version. No, the, 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 I think that's, that, that's mischaracterizing the intention. The, what, we, what, I, what, what at least I mean by an invariant when I raised the, the whole topic are uh, regularities that were true, uh, or, you know, that are, or that are true, um, uh, even if they weren't written down. Uh, many, much of what we're trying to do now is, I mean, part of the point of the current exercise is to get some of these things written down, uh, but many of these things have never been written down. Uh, like the thing about double equals and triple equals, uh, I don't remember ever seeing that written down, but, we are, but it was certainly an important part of the ES5 discussions. It's probably the meeting notes were the only, would be the only place they would have ever appeared. Uh, the thing about string concatenation uh, is I would still say abandoned invariants in the title of there because mm -hmm. it was an invariant. It wasn't a proposed invariant because invariant is, is a, is, it means that it was actually uh, true across the spec, which it was. So I'm wondering, um, I was also thinking of invariants as something people have defended, but I think it's, I think both are true. I wonder if there should be a way to, because there are many things that are true about the spec and we may not be able to write them all down. We might not be aware of all of them, mm -hmm. but there are certain things that have been defended about the spec. Right, right. So, uh, well, we're, so, so good. So we can, we can narrow this to um, uh, invariants that we're writing down because because somebody cares about them. Yeah, <laughs> it comes right. down to that. I, I mean, if we can find ones that people don't care about, but we can describe somehow, mm -hmm. although I think that would be an incredible amount of work. Yeah, so, so any, any proposal that modifies syntax is breaking what was previously an invariant, but it's not really relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think we should be more precise in our language. I, I would actually propose that we say invariant is something someone has defended. I would say that that's an invariant. It's a regularity of the spec that someone has said is important for some re for some reason. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and and they, it's not that they, that that has to have been in the past. It might be that they're saying it now, and as a result, we're writing it down. Yes, exactly. Okay. There's, there's a related phenomenon, and I wish I could think of a good, good ex example, but uh, I have a memory of having bumped into this, which is 
things which are normative in the spec, but um, largely observed in the breach, um, which are kind of um, uh, kind of fall under the heading of um, this, this goes along with this sort of the, the this sort of common law. Well, you, the, you know, this, everybody knows X when it's not actually in the spec. Yep. Um, and some of these invariants are, well, everybody knows that this is an invariant. And some of them are, well, yeah, the spec says this, but nobody actually implements it that way. Um, and once again, there's an effort to bring the spec into compliance with reality uh, through editing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that belongs here, but it strikes me that these things are potentially related. We do have an issue with having informal knowledge spread uh, across specific individuals in committee. That's definitely true. Because I think that, for example, this thing of everyone knows, it's everyone who can speak about that subject knows. And I think that's why it's so powerful to write this stuff down. We should get as much of this written down as possible, but that's definitely a secondary task that we need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 reach it. Um, right, uh, so if, it, uh, if anyone else has anything popping into their head as this is something someone brought up, they cared about it a lot, it's been broken, uh, or we have decided not yeah. to pursue that. Uh, are there any others we can list here? No, I think, I think a very painful broken invariant uh, is that um, uh, prior to the introduction of uh, modules, in particular prior to the introduction of the import statement and the export statement, uh, everything in JavaScript was generative, meaning uh, any, you know, any expression or declaration that created something you could nest it within a function and then it would create that thing uh, each time the function was called. Um, and that was a beautiful, beautiful regularity. It's the thing that allowed you to take anything and put it into an iffy. Um, uh, and uh, the, uh, the introduction of uh, imports and exports, uh, which can only appear at uh, top level, um, uh, means that you can no longer take the contents of an executable piece of code and just put it within a function and now create multiple instances of it. Uh. And this, you know, there, there, and there was a genuine trade-off there. Uh, I tried to fix this and uh, Dave Herman convinced me that I didn't know what I was doing. And in fact, you know, he was right at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I did not see a, a, an actual way to fix this, um, mm -hmm. but it was a, 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 a terrible loss. Can you, can you um, ex uh, I just added a new field here, uh, the break. Uh, so uh, when we're breaking the invariant, what's the breaking event? When uh, uh, import export syntax was introduced, what exactly happened? Uh, imports exports were the first was the first syntax that could only appear at top level. Uh -huh, you had okay. a syntactic construct you could not uh, equally put inside the body of a function. There was even an attempt to get import or export added to function bodies afterward. Yeah, I, 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 I tried to do that, and Dave Herman convinced me that my thing was incoherent. There, there was a second one. I forget who proposed it, but it was from Meteor, not from you oh. as well. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So it's been defended or attempted to be regained multiple times, but it hasn't okay. not. Sorry, I didn't pay attention to the Meteor thing. It might have maybe. Okay. I only know it because I spent too much time with modules. Yeah. Okay, I'll try to find links for that. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, I need to find a title for this, but I'll come up with uh, something. Expression uh, consistency, I don't know. No, it's uh, having a top level constructs or top lexical scope constructs. I'd, I'd say the real issue is uh, that it used to be the case that everything was generative. It's, it's, it's the, the, the 
you know, the, the, the syntax is the means by which the invariant was broken, but the important invariant was that the things being created, uh, anything that you can create, you can multiply instantiate because you can, because that would be the effect of, of nesting it in a function. Uh, I just lost the last part of what you said there. Mul multiply instantiate. That's what I thought. Okay, cool. Um, great. Uh, any others? Maybe if we can round it out to three and then we'll move on to the ones that currently exist, including Mark's um, invariant that was for discussion for uh, Intel segmenter and uh, aggregate error. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, a big one that people find surprising is the instance of operator change when we introduce the symbol for it. Mm -hmm. um, they, they found that instance of was a reliable way to do checking and we altered that. Basically every symbol we introduce has some level of breakage that we observably see where libraries rely on behaviors and we, by allowing them to be altered, break those. Okay, that's a good one. Uh, the one that's uh, in the same category um, uh, that uh, I would, uh, is the uh, use of object.prototype.toString.call on something uh, as a brand check. Uh, once we introduce the two string tag symbol, we lost the integrity of that as a brand check. Uh, and then we've been slowly recovering the ability to do some brand checks over time um, uh, using other primitives. Uh, but that used to just be a simple reliable brand check and it's no, no longer is. Okay, interesting, very interesting. I'm losing a little bit of detail, uh, so I'll probably ping both of you on this. Um, I've also got another field here, the rationale. Mm. Um, I want to make sure we don't lose that because I think knowing the rationale for why an invariant existed or just being able to say why might be able to help us be more flexible about thinking about those invariants, whether why they should be- or why it's in the current category, like abandoned. Uh, why it existed, why it was important to have, why someone defended it. Okay. So why, so why it existed, uh, well, I want to be careful, the, the two string uh, as a brand mechanism is a good example, where we, where why it existed, I think is not the relevant question. It's why, why was it useful? Uh, because the two string thing, I'm sure, initially happened by accident. It happened without any, simply without anybody having thought about its utility as a branding mechanism. Uh, but once it existed, people started using it as a brand check. Uh, and the, it, it, and it's, uh, their ability to use it as a brand check was because it was an invariant, even though it was an invariant that, uh, that originally arose accidentally. Mm -hmm. Right. Excellent. And I know for the comments one, it was an argument about insertion of license comments in particular. So now you need a more complicated parser to properly insert license comments. Okay, good. I'll also add impact then. How far back do we want to go with this? Um, uh, I am very open because I think this is also an interesting research project to help us understand how, how we've made concessions over time. I am more interested in the immediate last couple of years since ES6 to help us orient discussions today. Um, that's also why I want to move to ones that are currently under discussion, but I think it is useful to fill this out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, my, memory, that... my memory goes back very clearly to ES5. Um, mm -hmm. So it's natural for me to think to, to uh, go that far back. I think it is, I, and I will say, I think it remains useful to go back to ES5. Uh, I simply can't contribute with regard to history before ES5. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I was thinking in particular about um, 
about the significance of introducing getters and setters. You know, accessor oh. uh, properties mm -hmm. were a really big invariant break. Uh, so that so I, so actually, let me speak to that a little bit because I, I was there. Uh, that was part of the S five, and uh, the ES three as a standard had no accessors. However, um, uh, three out of the four browsers, all the browsers, all the major browsers other than Internet Explorer, um, had accessors. Uh, they had it through the uh, uh, Dunder um, uh, define define. What was it? It was it was like define getter and define setter. Yeah, that's right. Define getter, define setter, lookup getter, lookup setter. Uh, there were these Dunder properties that are still de facto present on object prototype. Uh, so in ES five, uh, we took the rule that uh, anything that was true in three out of the four browsers was a strong candidate for codification into ES5. Um, uh, and um, uh, so accessors uh, got into ES5 in that way. So in that sense, uh, they, they, broke, they might have broken a spec invariant, but they didn't break any de facto invariant because uh, the accessors were already present. Okay, let's move on to the current uh, ones. Okay. So that, because I, uh, this is a conversation that's gonna take uh, place over a long period of time, I suspect. Right. Um, I'm just gonna commit this. I can say the, um, the expectation of concatenatability of scripts uh, goes back to, I think, Dean Edwards' Packer, which I think was around 2005, maybe a little earlier. Mm -hmm. this was the, the, the earliest bundlers would effectively just concatenate and minify. Right. Okay. Um, let's move on to the known invariants. And I want to start with, uh, I have here uh, clarifying the hazard of prototype accessors for internal slots. Mm -hmm. And okay. let me let me let's start with that one because that's that's what started us talking about this. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to introduce I'm going to coin a term, um, uh, which is an exotic internal slot. Um, uh, and what I so we already have in the spec the terminology of exotic versus normal objects. Um, uh, for the normal objects, there is a set of slots defined as the slot as the, the slots that normal objects have. Uh, any slot that is not in that set, I'm going to go ahead and define as an exotic slot. I need terminology for it. Um, uh, can you repeat that? Uh, so um, you define it as an um, any slot which is not within the set of slots on a defined ordinary object, was that right? That's correct. There's a set of slots that the spec defines that uh, for uh, as the slots that ordinary objects carry. Uh, any internal slot that is not in that set, I'm going to go ahead and define as an exotic slot. It would Probably be better to find a different term. Not that I have a great one to suggest right now. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm happy yeah. for it to be a different term, but I need it. I need. I need uh, to make a distinction there. Right. Understood. Okay. Right. Um, mem certain members of the committee really balked at uh, the concept of this being exotic. Okay. Uh, yep. Okay. Um, yeah, we just need to know what it is for now, and we can yeah, no, you know, it works to totally fine for this discussion. Like, yeah, agreed. Okay. okay, so the the current invariant is that the exotic internal slots carry only data, not objects. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, can we be more specific about data? Are we talking about primitives here? Yes. Okay, let me write that as primitives. Okay. And, and that's, I, that's the invariant, right? That is the invariant. So there are knock-on effects to this, right? Yeah, um, and uh, the, the knock-on effect uh, is hard to explain, which is why it's taken me a while to put together a presentation mm -hmm. uh, on this. Um, the, uh, there's, um, uh, Kriti is not here in this call? No. No, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Richard, you work with Kriti, right? We've had discussions on this topic. Okay. Uh, so Kariti came up with this near membrane idea that they've been doing work on at Salesforce. Uh, it's very clever. It's, it's uh, different than the normal membrane. Um, and uh, the near membrane is trying to make objects that are on the other side of the membrane seem to just be regular objects within this realm. So the realm bound, the membrane boundary is in, for near membrane, the membrane boundary is not perceived to, to be like a realm boundary. Uh, and, uh, as, and that's a different form of transparency than the normal membrane transparency that I've been defending over the years. It's, it's, it's one that until Kariti walked me through it, I didn't actually believe it was possible. Um, uh, now, the problem with an exotic internal slot is that the built-in methods that access the internal slot. It doesn't necessarily just have to be a built-in getter. It could be any built-in method that accesses the internal slot. Um, and I always like to go back to date as the clearest example. Um, uh, the, when that method is applied to a proxy for a date, uh, it fa the proxy itself does not have the internal slot. The target might very well be the, an object that has the internal slot, uh, but the proxy mechanism purposely does not punch through to the target. Um, and uh, the result is that uh, you that the date object, for example, that whatever object it is that carries the internal slot fails to act like a near object. The fact that you're accessing it through a proxy uh, breaks the illusion. Uh, and then you can, you can do this rather painful uh, monkey patching or, of all of your primordials, which is also what um, Kariti came up with, so that um, you can replace, for example, date.prototype.getFullYear, uh, just replace it on the prototype uh, in a system that wants to support uh, 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 near membranes, uh, replace it with something that's in bed with the near membrane uh, mechanism, uh, such that um, when it's applied to a proxy for a date, uh, where the proxy is part of a near membrane, um, that it that the 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 new primitive the the the, you know, the 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 get full year that was introduced by the monkey patching detects that because it's in bed with the uh, near membrane implementation, uh, it can then uh, emulate the original behavior by. Uh, applying the, um, uh, the method to the target rather than the proxy. Um, so this is complicated and weird. And every time you introduce a new internal slot, you can only preserve near membrane transparency 
by this monkey patching. Uh, as long as you only introduce state um, uh, through properties, uh, you have no, including simple name properties, uh, you have no such problem. And you said using simple name properties, you don't have such a problem, right? Right. Any state introduced by properties, including symbol name properties, does not symbol. have a problem. Symbol, symbol. Using symbol name properties. Yeah. Okay, symbol so... Name. Right. Uh, but the way that, that I've started thinking about it is that a, a value that you can get a handle on that can access exotic internal slots is a superpower. So you, uh, so now we're uh, moving to a second layer. So there's two layers to this invariant. One is that um, internal slots are painful for proxies, just in general. And no, now well, we're- they're, 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 yeah, well, they're painful for proxies in general because uh, they're not transparent through proxies. Proxies are unaware of them, uh, and they're, uh, but usually they don't break practical transparency of membranes. Um, in the case of near membranes, they break tra practical transparency. Uh, but, but this is true for just introducing exotic internal slots in general. Uh, mm -hmm. Then I'm going to take the second step, which is why the internal slot ver holding objects is a different category of danger than an internal slot holding data, mm -hmm. which is if the internal slot holds data, then this weird monkey patching you need for near membrane transparency, um, uh, uh, if it, you know, if, if this new mechanism effectively punches through and accesses it from the target, well, then you've successfully accessed the data from the other side of the membrane, which is not at all dangerous. It's actually the transparency that you were trying for, and data is supposed to get, go through membranes uh, without modification. Uh, if the internal slot holds an object, then you have to be, uh, then any kind of punching through mechanism has to be in a much deeper way in bed with the membrane mechanism because the reference as provided on the other side of the membrane must itself be membrane. You can't just convey the capability itself because then you break membrane isolation. And the reason why this isn't fatal is that the, you, know, you already have to do this complex intervention to create near membranes. The complex intervention can be made more complex in this way, but it's a cost. And it's a uh, cost not just in complexity, it's a cost in potentially breaking security if you make a mistake at something that's already complicated. Okay, so uh, I want to clarify a couple of things with this one. Um, so uh, do we mean security here or do we mean integrity? Uh, we mean isolation. Isolation. Or separation. Okay. Separ separation is actually a better term for membranes. Okay. Um, okay. And so this second half, this is the trickier bit of this. Um, actually, before we get into that, I want to get a better definition for near membrane. If we have a definition written down somewhere for near membrane, I can pull it out of there if you give me a link. Uh, or we can try to uh, knock it out here. Uh, Richard, do you know if there there is something written down on near membranes? Not that I've seen. Okay. Okay. Can I ping Carity to define near membranes clearly in this context? Sure. Okay. So um, to do. 
Uh, okay, and the other question I have about this is, is this one invariant or is this two invariants that we're talking about here? So there's, we already have exotic internal slots, so there's no invariant that we don't have them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it's one of these uh, things where uh, each one introduces more pain. So mm -hmm. there is a preference. Um, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't even say it's a soft invariant. It's just a preference to try to avoid okay. them. Uh, let's add another category. Um, what's a good word for something that you avoid? Landmine. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Okay. So this is a known landmine. Okay. So, but but there's but another it, one that's related. There's it, it, um, it, a, a more important point there, which is that it is a known landmine, uh, in the sense that people know about it, and we would like it to be known in the sense that it's written down somewhere, just as you yeah. advocated writing things down in general. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Now there's something that's also about exotic internal slots uh, that's actually more important than the uh, thing about avoiding, um, uh, you know, about, about the, more important than the data versus object distinction. Mm -hmm. um, and this, but this one is a soft invariant because we have a few violations. Uh, and that is, the soft invariant is that methods or accessors uh, that access exotic internal slots only access them on their this argument. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason why this is so important, this is the reason why membranes can be practically um, uh, transparent, not near membranes, just normal membranes can be practically transparent, where uh, what I mean by transparent is if you put them between realms, uh, it acts as it, it, it acts just like a realm boundary as if there's no membrane between the realms. So you still have all the semantic costs of a realm boundary, which turned out to be really tricky and hazardous on their own. But, it, but, but the practical transparency is that putting a membrane there doesn't make anything practically work. And once again, date is a good example. Uh, uh, date instances have an exotic internal slot that actually holds the uh, date and time value. Um, and all of the uh, uh, get and set methods on date.prototype, all of them access or modify that internal slot, but they only do it on their this argument. The result is that if I'm, let's say, on the yellow side of a membrane and I have a yellow proxy for a blue date, and on my yellow proxy, I do a date dot get full year, uh, I'm getting the full year method through the membrane. So I end up with a yellow proxy for the blue get full year, um, uh, which I'm then invoking on the this object, which is, which is the date that I got the get full year from, the one that I applied the dot to, is uh, so, uh, so that turns into um, you know, both things, the invocation of the um, going through the membrane, the this argument also goes through the membrane, and everything works. So, so accessing remote dates through a membrane when you're fetching the method by dot just works. And that's because of this uh, soft this invariant. Um, mm. The, the, the uh, thing that's not transparent, even with this invariant, uh, and the, and which is the reason why I keep uh, you know, introducing the practical versus truly uh, transparent distinction is if I do in the yellow world, date.prototype 
dot getfullyear dot call, and I uh, to and I apply it to a yellow proxy for a blue date. That will work across a realm boundary, but will not work across a membrane boundary. Um, so that's the unrepairable non-transparency, uh, but it's odd code that takes a normal instance method and applies it using dot call. Uh, um, so we're only breaking the odd code. We're not breaking the normal use case code. Okay, let me see if I got this right. I'm gonna ask you for an image for this later, Mark, because you spoke about it so visually. In the first case, it was without call, and in the second case, it's with dot call, right? That's the difference. No, the first case is a date instance, lowercase uh -huh. date, okay. dot full year. Good. Right. And then this, this, okay, good. So I had it right. And then, and then no, the, the second case is the dot call mm -hmm. and then put the, the date instance between the parentheses. Uh -huh. Good. Right. Okay, good. And uh, I'll, I'll ask, uh, I'll ping you about uh, clearing up this section a bit because I think this will be really useful to have clearly mm -hmm. outlined. Yeah, so um, one, one curveball that I want to add before we move on from it is that mm -hmm. the invariant of this section mm -hmm. is not actually invariant. Right. Mm -hmm. There is, yep. there is uh, one part of ECMA 262 that I'm aware of where the exotic internal slot does hold an object that is exposed to uh, ECMAScript code. Mm -hmm. What is that? It is data view dot prototype dot buffer. Huh. You're right. Um, so I'm wondering, is this is this part of this previous invariant, the hazard of prototype accessors on I, I'm just always asking, so, are we talking about the same invariant in all of these cases, or do we want to split these up into separate ones in part to make it easier to digest what they are? So uh, I would say that the prototype accessor um, is, uh, uh, is not really the core issue. It's the internal slot. Um, uh, uh, and so it's just the hazard of exotic internal slots, right? Yeah. We, we wish it were an invariant that mm -hmm. no internal, no exotic internal slot contained something, it contained a non-primitive value exposed to running code. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it okay. almost is, but there's at least one exception. Right, right. Okay. And then the, the uh, other invariant that I was just explaining about you only about built in methods only access internal slots on from this mm -hmm. is also a soft invariant. Um, mm -hmm. but, but in this one, the exceptions to the soft invariant are very interesting uh, because the exceptions actually preserve practical transparency. Okay, one second, because um, it's a separate invariant. I want to put it separately. Yeah. We might put headings in here and do other kinds of uh, organizing of the information. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this is a separate invariant. So I'm going to turn this into a description here. Yes. Okay, um, can you repeat what you just said? Yes, uh, this one is also a soft invariant uh, mm -hmm. because there are a few violations uh, the, the, it's, however, the, na the nature of those violations preserve practical transparency um, uh, for, uh, and, and, uh, interest, in, an, in interesting enough ways that they're worth walking through. Mm -hmm. 
And I'll just enumerate them right now. We can, mm -hmm. we can walk through them offline or, or now if anybody wants to discuss them. Mm -hmm. uh, so one is that um, uh, the, um, Array dot is array uh, uh, checks um, whether the uh, object is an array um, and uh, but we specifically because it's checking a non this argument that one we specially made punch through proxies. We made a special exception to the proxy mechanism so that if you apply array.isarray to a proxy whose target is an array, it says true. So uh, in, that, in that sense, you could say that the, the larger invariant uh, is that uh, if a built-in accesses it on a non-this, then the built-in uh, also, when given a proxy, uh, somehow approximates its normal behavior. Martin, I'm going to raise a quick side point on this. Yeah. Uh, not not for uh, what's being discussed here, but a few weeks ago, you may recall, we talked about um, promise.delegate. I'm wondering if there might be any implications for that there. Okay, so uh, you're, you're exactly in the neighborhood of the next interesting invariant violation, which is promise.resolve. So promise.resolve um, uh, when applied to a, um, an object determines whether the, you know, applied to an argument, the argument not being the this, um, uh, it determines whether it's a promise. If you apply it to a proxy for a promise, it is not, the proxy for the promise is not a promise. Uh, and the result is that uh, proxy.resolve applied to a promise returns the promise. Proxy.resolve applied to a proxy for a promise does not return the proxy for the promise. But because the proxy for the promise is venable, it falls back to the normal venable assimilation behavior causing it to practically act as having preserved the promise behavior of um, uh, the, uh, prom the, 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 the proxy promise. So this one was fortuitous. This one, uh, I only noticed it after the fact that the fact that promise.resolve um, uh, applies to a non-this and the fact that promise.resolve has the venable assimilation behavior, the fact that the one irregularity kind of cancels out the other uh, was just an ac a happy accident, but it preserved practical transparency. Or at least it will until promises are able to pipeline messages, right? Yes. Uh, that's correct. Okay. Um, I don't want to slow things down, um, but you might want to list as maybes, um, promise.reject, promise.all, promise.race. I don't know if we want to spend any more time on those. I mean, we're already at two o'clock here. Yeah. We might want to cut this short because we have talked about it for an hour. Okay. Um, but I think we should pick this up again. And you should all feel totally free to edit this set of documents on your own uh, at any time. I can also give you uh, commit access so you can just uh, write whatever comes to mind. Um, a couple of things that I want to do, maybe we can do a second round of this, uh, is really clearly define the rationale for these things. Like 
why do we want to maintain membrane uh, practical transparency because of and then like the goal that we're trying to achieve which is to maintain separation or um, yes isolation between components for example uh, or maintain the capability for that to happen so um, yep good yeah, Good. let's pause here and then uh, I'm happy to give other people airtime. Okay, uh, Dan, I think you're next. Um, all right. Um, yeah, I have I have a kind of fun little thing that uh, might might be a nice little break between this and the TC39 things. Um, I had a a project where I was here. Let me let me gather it and share screen. Um, so here, yeah, let me set up screen sharing first. Um, sorry, finding the right uh, window. Oh, here we go. Okay. So I have, I, I uh, was doing some experiments. Um, I, I had a little side project uh, on the weekend. I was um, making a server and it had some clients and I wanted to expose the, um, you know, some capabilities from the back end to the clients over WebSockets. And I was trying to do it with uh, CapTP. Um, and I found myself uh, basically indulging in a, a, an exploration of what it's like to build a uh, CAPTP friendly application. And um, so, so uh, un unlike the, the conversation we were just having, I think we were really looking at what are the constraints of the language, how, how clear can we make a membrane. Here I'm really just looking at uh, what can I practically achieve with um, you know, modern JavaScript um, in terms of having a framework that is very friendly to, um, to a CAFTP type architecture. So, so the goals that I had were that, uh, that the, the controllers or components would be easy to distribute across uh, different processes, but they could either be distributed or any given uh, aspect would be easy to delegate. Um, and, and so coding locally or remotely should feel the same. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to want to unpack the feel the same a lot because yeah. the CAPTP was designed for half of that. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Because CAPTP is, of course, a completely asynchronous uh, interface. Right. Yeah, it was designed so that. Uh, uh, if you treat uh, any object that you're treating as remote, uh, if the object happens to be local, everything should work. So, um, but if, you're, if the object is local, you can access it synchronously. And if you do access synchronously, if you take advantage of its lo being local, then if it's actually remote, uh, it, there's, you know, it, it will not simply work. Uh, so we're only trying to do, um, uh, network transparency in one direction, that right. local objects should have all the powers of remote objects, but re remote objects can't have all the powers of local objects. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that sounds, that sounds uh, right and reasonable. Um, um, and, and yet for the purpose of this experiment, I, I think I was, I was going for be the same. Like, could I make a local environment where I was comfortable enough in it that I could take a controller and pass it directly over the network membrane and, uh, and continue operating in the same way. Um, so, so that was, that's the experiment uh, here. So I, I was, uh, I hit upon, so I've got another little document where I was documenting kind of the constraints of CAPTP, right? Where today all, all records have to be, all references passed over CAPTP have to be either records or interfaces. So yep. records being totally static uh, value objects, interfaces, objects whose children are only functions. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was quickly the thing that I hit. So I, I found that I, I couldn't uh, pass most objects over CAPTP because of this interface. And so I was experimenting with what would a you know, JavaScript object model look like that was very friendly to its models being passed over, uh, over CAPTP. And this means that pretty much every object needs to be an interface and it can only uh, expose its records by, uh, by getters or something. Um, 
So uh, anyways, what, what I came up with um, is uh, something, uh, oh yeah, here, it's a, it's a little GitHub repo. It's called Caputi right now. It's very much uh, just a, a toy. Um, but you, you get this grain function and you wrap it around any given uh, JavaScript uh, primitive, like a string or a number, array or an object, um, from pretty much anything uh, that is synchronously available normally. And it exposes, um, it exposes an interface that, or let me, I'll zoom in a little bit more. Th there is a notion of a read-only one where it has a get or subscribe. Um, but if it's, if it's yours, by default, it actually also gives you um, the ability to write, which includes a set and a there function. And, um, and so you get this setter and better, uh, this uh, setter, um, you get setters and getters, and then there's also a function for just making it a read only. Um, the, the there is, is an idea from Mark where uh, you'll see that it, uh, well, here, I'll get to there in a second. It also has a notion of getting exclusivity um, because if we've got multiple clients who might be operating and performing logic on a remote value, uh, they might need to get an exclusive claim on that value so they can update it. So basically wrap some mutex around everything. Um, so you can, you can get a couple of values, um, mutate on it, and then release your mutex. Um, and then, and then the, uh, I added a there function, which uses sess under the hood to uh, give you a, a context to perform synchronous operations in the remote context of the value. So so this, this works the same whether it's local or remote because it's now it's going to return a promise, but it's going to go up to the server where this value is. It's going to, uh, uh, yeah. So just the, um, the there function does not look like my there function. Have you seen my there function? I, I haven't. I was, I was totally uh, improvising it off of a, a verbal description you'd given once. Okay. Um, I, I would love to hear how you, how you uh, would would design it. Okay, I'll I'll actually uh, find it and, and post the link in a yeah. moment. Cool. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, this is this is totally an experiment and like a jumping off ground to just explore what uh, what a CAFTP friendly uh, programming environment might look like. Um, uh, I also made a component for a grain map, so you can set multiple values on this, and then a key distinction of it, so it has setters and getters, but it, it's there also makes each of those values synchronously available uh, within it, which is, you know, maybe that's totally crazy. Um, but that, uh, that experience felt so good that it started making me think that uh, ideally you could have assets or resources from multiple different remote servers and you could have a notion of calling there on them, which would just, uh, Basically, ideally, this would get locks on both of the values in some trusted environment, and then give you a place to uh, perform that um, that atomic operation. Um, but but you get to program it within this block as if they were synchronously available. Um, so um, yeah. Anyways, that was that was basically the the experiment. Um, uh, just kind of wanted to wanted to play with CAPTP. Wanted to have a very JavaScript first. Um, kind of isomorphic uh, environment to to make a project in. Um, so so very uh, curious to hear any feedback. I I have one 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 thing that struck me is you've got this get exclusive um, mm -hmm. thing um, uh, that that it, it, it seems like what you're trying to control there is interleaving. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, I don't know how this works under the hood, but, but, um, um, you know, a lot of this can be reframed just in terms of uh, message order and interleaving patterns. Um, uh, Dean has an abstraction that they played with in Midori called a flow, which I don't completely understand, but I suspect may be related where it, this is not, this is not necessarily the same as like a mutex where you get a lock that prevents you know, that, that blocks out anybody else. This is more like you want to make sure that these these two messages get to their destination without any other message traffic getting in the middle of it. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if, I mean, I, I'm just sort of free associating here, but I'm, I'm wondering if that, um, 
that flow abstraction might be a different way of coming at the same problem um, that's a little less like trying to do remote locking. Yeah, I, I think for some use cases that could do it. Um, I think the locking was just like the most versatile tool that I could think of to cover all the use cases I had where sometimes I might want to operate on a value when the operation is itself asynchronous, in which case I need to get the value, know that nothing else is going to change it. Uh, maybe that could be done with the interleaving and it's just a different pattern of, uh, of making it. Uh, I'm not sure how I would uh, expose it differently. Well, the thing is, is when you, when you get, a, if you've got a, a, a thing that supports promise pipelining, getting mm -hmm. a value means getting a thing that you can send further messages to. And so mm -hmm. um, really, if you want to do something on that value, you just want to make sure that, that there's nothing else that got in between you. Right. Yeah, just, yeah, actually part of this was inspired by uh, some experience where I was trying to do promise pipelining where I wanted to involve a value that wasn't a result of the pipeline. Like promise pipelining, you can operate on the returned value of the next right. one, but there wasn't that, a good that, way to- that, that, That's one of, the, one of the things that Dean's flow abstraction specifically uh, mm -hmm. is intended to deal with. And uh, like I said, I don't completely understand it, but you know, next time you're talking to him, you might, you might uh, take this as a, as a, as a topic to, to chat about. Yeah, great. Well, so uh, my, my reaction is this is kind of, you know, ironically going against the grain <laughs> yeah. of um, uh, the computational paradigm that uh, CAPTP was built to support. I mean, the, the computational paradigm of communicating event loops uh, it's really not trying to do this. What this looks like with the get and set and the get exclusive mm. uh, is more like shared memory. Um, uh, mm. That uh, you know, you've got remote locations that you're updating or, re or reading, and then you've got um, uh, you know, semaphores or mutual exclusion locks. Uh, for coordinating multiple updates. Um, right. And I mean, it's interesting that you can, I mean, that's obviously it's a well understood, uh, well trodden computational paradigm for concurrency. And it's interesting that it codes so straightforwardly uh, into CAPTP, but it's really very foreign from what CAPTP was meant to support. Uh, okay. The idea is that um, the interface objects uh, the interfaces should not be getters and setters, that they're not designed to be getters and setters. Uh, the operations, the methods on the interface are designed to be semantically coherent atomic operations in themselves. So that typically, not always, but typically, um, uh, you don't need uh, atomicity between such operations. You just need the atomicity within the operation. So you send one message across to where the object is. The object receives the message, does the entire method in one turn of the event loop, which is therefore atomic. Mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, so that's why the interface objects, well, that's why we have such a strong distinction, a strong dichotomy between the records or the, you know, which we refer to as pass by copy objects uh, versus the interface objects is that the data, um, uh, the normal way to access data in this paradigm uh, is to get copies of immutable data because the data is immutable. It doesn't um, uh, deviate. Uh, you know, the copies don't stay, don't get out of sync with each other because they had to be frozen in the first place in order to be copied. So the records have to be frozen, not just objects with data properties, they have to be frozen objects with data properties. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and the result is that we, um, that we never find ourselves doing any kind of classical distributed mutual exclusion or mutual or, or classic distributed atomic transactions. 
uh, part of you know part of how we came to the paradigm back in the E days uh, mm -hmm. is the idea that um, the vat is the unit of atomicity, and the vats are coupled only asynchronously. So you should organize your computation so that any time you need atomicity, you only need it within one vat. Yeah, one of the things I'd add to that, um, I, I like the way Mark framed it in terms of not thinking in terms of getters and setters on state, is just in general, the object idea should not be framed as there's some state over there and I'm going to manipulate it by remote control. Uh, because in a distributed system, what you end up having to do is you end up having to keep your, your own local model of somebody else's state when it's in fact the other thing's job to know what its state is. And what you end up doing there is you end up building in um, a bunch of coupling with how something is structured internally that's really none of your business um, because it has made all of its internal structure part of its published API. Um, and so I like to think in terms of the way I, I frame it is I think of it in terms of behavioral protocols rather than representational protocols. I'd like to raise another point if I may. Um, I see a big concern here with, the, with having a, a remote mutex like we are doing here. A um, couple of possibilities that might happen that would completely screw everybody over would be if an exception gets thrown after you've grabbed that lock, but before you've released it, all it, all it takes is a local exception and you've kind of blown everything up. Um, the second would be if the engine underneath crashed or was, or had a, or the tab was closed or things like that again, or even just forgetting to release the lock in the first place. Right. Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah, that definitely makes sense. Yeah, that's, so, that's why, uh, Alex, I'm glad you raised that because uh, the, if you think of what Dan's doing is kind of like the Java shared memory multi-threading. Um, uh, the uh, Java used to have this thing called thread.stop um, and they deprecated it and, and they you know, strongly deprecated it and really wanted people to stop using it uh, because um, uh, any object that, that uh, where the thread held the lock on the object when you stop the thread, those objects would just stay locked forever. And there was nothing you could do about them. If you, if you just forced a lock release, then you had corrupted objects with no lock on them, which is even worse than letting them stay locked. Uh, with communicating event loops, uh, the way we're using them, uh, we treat the VAT as the atomic failure unit. Uh, and we make a lot of use of that. You can always just shoot a VAT in the head uh, and all of the other VATs should stay consistent and stay responsive um, uh, after that happens. You do still have like like the memory leak problems. I mean, I guess like weak ref is meant to uh, fix that, right? But when you get a reference, you're still responsible for releasing it. And that seems like a kind of similar thing where you're reserving, uh, you know, a listener status. And so I think those both have to be kind of addressed in different ways. So, um, well, yeah, the, but, thing, but yeah. the thing is, if you don't release it, you have a leak. Whereas right. uh, in this one, if you don't release it, you then have, uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, the, the distributed leaks, the, the need for distributed garbage collection was the motivation uh, we, uh, that Dean and I had for introducing weak refs into the language. Right. Cool. Uh, yeah, the, this is, yeah, that has been very uh, useful and educational for me. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I think, I think just getting my head into the, the paradigm of how this, how you would interact with multiple VATs versus, you know, by remote control or whatever. I think, I think it's a bit of a mental shift that, uh, I, I and other JavaScript uh, uh, members. Yeah, that yeah. To. We'll have to find ways to do the. We have to find the par the new paradigm solutions to familiar problems, right? Um, I feel like the uh, the motivation for wanting to have an accessor listener um, is probably because you want to be able to watch live data in a user interface. Yeah. Right. So yeah. Um, the 
um, this isn't something I've thought about a lot of, but perhaps um, Mark or Chip, uh, you have uh, solved this problem before, I assume. Yeah, so um, there is a, um, uh, so you know, this, this will seem inconsistent with what I was saying, which um, uh, you know, previously I, 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 I was saying, we're not trying to do distributed shared memory. And the exception to that uh, is um, uh, the, the simplest unum, which we've coded over and over again, uh, which is uh, what we call the Lamport cell. Um, I swear the idea for such a thing originally came from Lamport, but I couldn't find it when I tried to look yeah. it up. Unum is spelled with a U. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Latin one. U-N-U-M. Uh, unum is chips coinage, uh, and it's a much more uh, general idea than, than uh, the particular uh, use that I'm making of it. Um, but the idea with a Lamport cell is that you have an object that acts like a memory cell, it has a get and it has a get method and a set method. Um, but uh, when you um, uh, pass it through cap, you know, future CAPTP, CAPTP enhanced beyond the CAPTP we have now, and this re requires uh, enhancements at the CAPTP level, you can't build it on the outside. Uh, uh, this is a third category we call pass by construction, um, where it's the original object that contributes the code or contributes instructions uh, that says how to construct its remote presence. So the remote presence is supposed to act in some ways like the original object. Um, it's a shadow, you can, you can, we also sometimes call it a shadow of the original object. Um, uh, and the degree to which it is like the original object is up to the, is up to that object itself. It's up to the, the, the designed unum nature of the object. Uh, in the case of the Lamport cell, what we're trying to achieve is uh, eventual consistency. So the shadow uh, would have a synchronous get method. It would not have a synchronous set method. Um, so in that sense, the shadow you can think of as a read-only view on the original, except that the, uh, that the shadow is only eventually consistent with the original. The synchronous get method uh, gives you back a stale value. It gives you back a value that's as recent as possible, um, but you should always assume that it's not current. Um, and then uh, we enhance the, the Lamport cell uh, with a observer protocol, uh, uh, which is because in, in order to make the Lamport cell work, we internally had to build an observer protocol anyway. So we then just expose that observer protocol uh, so that you can then all, so that uh, Lamport cells um, have uh, both get and set and uh, further methods uh, for uh, observing them or um, asynchronously updating them. Uh, and I can give uh, pointers to the uh, old Eve um, uh, Lamport cell protocol. Um, that um, I just put a pointer to my Unum write-up on the uh, Zoom chat. Great. Um, oh, thank you. So I'll, I'll find the Lamport cell thing. Um, That's Lamport is in Leslie Lamport, so L-A-M-P-O-R-T. Oh, oh. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Um, um, it, it, you're, I, I, you're calling it a Lamport cell. I feel like that means that it has some internal facility for resolving conflicts or divergence. Um, but no. No, no. It, it, it does not. Um, uh, like, it, it might be that I'm naming this wrong, because when I tried to look back at Lamport's paper to find the thing, I could not. But I named it this originally because I thought the idea came from, from Lamport. Well, more than one idea came from Leslie, so. Well, yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, you got it from your, your memory of, of Lamport, which means you got it from Lamport, at least indirectly. Right. It gets, maybe my, as long as my memory is eventually consistent, right? Yeah. Well, which is to say, you, you're, you're giving him credit even if he never said it. 
because yeah. he did. He would have eventually. Sure said it. <laughs> yeah, uh, when I'm asked um, uh, why is it that I keep uh, looking for new ideas in the writings of of, of Lamport, I say, well, because the the ideas are brighter over there. Oh, good lamp. Yeah. Lamp post. I'll, I'll, yeah. All right. Well, I'm sold. I'll, I'll be looking into his writings. Okay. Um, uh, so <laughs> in any case, I do, I do want to revive this uh, for modern CAPTP. Um, uh, uh, and I think I want to revive it separately from trying to revive the general UNAM model. I think this one is actually worth building in directly as a special case. Uh, and this special case uh, 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 Michael Fig and I uh, came up with a very nice packaging of where the special case appears, which is uh, we want to be able to, when declaring that an object is an interface object, uh, to actually contradict what I was saying earlier and be able to declare that some of its properties, some of the properties of the interface object should be treated as um, uh, eventually consistent data properties. So when you get a remote presence for the interface, you can remotely send um, methods, your method calls, but you can also locally access the, um, uh, the declared uh, uh, eventually consistent data properties. Uh, and that those are behind the scenes perpetually being updated to be recent. And with some method of watching it even. Uh, right. I, I guess. Cool. Yeah. And, the, yeah, the, and that, that does sound like, it sounds quite a bit like what I made here. Like maybe I made an atom of a sort of observable, eventually consistent remote thing. Although it doesn't have the synchronous uh, get. Uh, Partly because it's a violation of a current cap TP uh, invariant, but um, yeah, uh, which I guess just requires customizing at the Marshall layer, if I'm understand right. Yes, um, it'll be quite. It'll, it'll well, probably not just at the Marshall layer. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's yeah, one yeah. of these things where I'll, I'll know it when I start doing it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I'm definitely talking to Michael uh, about this uh, stuff. Yeah. Um, in, my, uh, in that in that paper, well, paper, that essay I wrote on on reactive design patterns, um, the, there's a the critical distinction between different types of data you might put in this kind of cell um, for uh, whether they model things that are continuous or discreetly changing, um, and uh, there are implications for what the network should do with that kind of data, depending on if, if the if the if the sender is changing the value more frequently than the receiver is metering it or part sampling it. Um, so, uh, like, it, it would be good to have the network layer aware of the domain of the value, so that it knows whether it can drop data or whether it should be pushed or pulled. Right, right. The, well, the, well, idea, with the, cell, the, sorry. the idea with the Lamport cell is that you're only interested in the most recent value you can get. You're not interested in watching all the transitions. Right, so it's a push model and the network is free to drop messages. Yes. Um, can, yeah. we, can we go back for a in, moment? In, um, in, partic in particular, you don't care about the history, um, the complete an accurate history. You just care about what the world is like right now. Could we go back to the um, to the potential problems? Um, I just realized another one. Um, if you're asking for a mutex, what's going to happen when that mutex is when that request is denied? Um. In the in the current state of this application, I believe it waits for uh, current outstanding new Texas, but it's it's a very like naive uh, interface right now. Um, I think that individual implementations would have to have some kind of unlocking procedure. Um, but yeah, right now it's it's a it's a naive wait your turn in line kind of system. 
Yeah, that's the third thing. Lamport cell still has no distributed atomicity. Right. Yeah. I just pasted, Dan, I just pasted uh, the link to the there, um, which was uh, a very, very ancient, um, uh, uh, 20, I think 2011 proposal, uh, part of the 2011 proposal that eventually became um, uh, uh, the ECMAScript promises was the promise portion of this proposal. But uh, since you're projecting, uh, th there is just a code snippet. So if you could maybe just follow the yeah. link and, and project that. Oh my, I had to go all the way. It fell off the internet. All the way to the archive. Yeah, yeah. so there at the <laughs> top of the screen. Um, oh, uh, the map reduced light, uh, I can zoom uh, in. Above that. that oh, there. there, there it is. Okay, so that's the definition of there. Um, and the, uh, this, this there is written as a static method rather than a method on a promise. Uh, so right. the P is the promise. For a modern there, you would say, you would have uh, there be a method on P taking callback and opt airback as arguments. So that right. there seems more like then. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the idea is that the callback is the success callback, uh, but that's the one that's the function that's going to be sent to the data. Uh, and that that function must be a closed function. Uh, it uh, mu must only capture the universal globals it can't mention freely anything other than the universal globals. And then the opt right. airback is the normal, um, uh, you know, then style airback, which is a local function. It does not get sent to the data. Um, uh, it stays local. Uh, so what I do here is um, the, the quote, quote, plus callback uh, mm -hmm. relies on a in a informal invariant that has now been formalized, we should remember to add this to uh, Yulia's page, uh, which is that uh, it was always the case that most functions in JavaScript, if turned into a string, gave you back a string that if evaluated in a similar lexical scope, would give you back a function that had the same call behavior. We've now formalized that in the spec uh, as that the um, uh, function dot prototype dot to string dot call of any function gives you back either exactly the original source code or a string that is guaranteed not to parse. So for example, built-in methods gives you back a string that's guaranteed not to parse that has that little square bracket native in it. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, ha however, the source code doesn't always um, correspond to something that will evaluate um, uh, that to a similar function. The unfortunate exception is uh, when you use concise method syntax in modern JavaScript, mm -hmm. um, the source code of a concise method, if evaluated out of context, does not give you back a, a function. Um, uh, it, and uh, it, it's also not guaranteed not to evaluate. There's weird edge cases where it can evaluate to something unrelated. So let's ignore concise method syntax. If you ignore concise method syntax, then uh, the stringification of callback gives you back the original method source code, met the function source code, which is supposed mm -hmm. to be a closed function. You're then evaluating it um, uh, in some foreign bat, uh, in particular, the that. Um, this eval at p means uh, if p is a remote promise, which that is a remote promise to? Mm. And so, and then whichever one that is, evaluate the string in that that. Um, 
And since that evaluation itself happens asynchronously, give me back a promise for the eventually evaluated function. Um, so then, Yeah, when I was looking into implementing there in Q, uh, the, uh, Dan, have you, are you familiar with how, what are, what are you calling it now, handled promise? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the way these things work is that like all of these method calls on a promise get translated into messages that can be pipelined, right? And the way I was going to implement this was that the their method was itself um, a thinly veiled message that gets gets sent as with with the their method name and the text of the function to be called. And the way it would work is that uh, the network would carry it all the way to where wherever the promise was local, right? Um, and it and it would be responsible for rehydrating it into a compartment. It didn't have a compartment at the time, right? So uh, it, it yeah. lays on the shop floor still. <laughs> right, and that's why it's a fun time to pick this back up. Um, yes, exactly. Are you talking yeah. about uh, the promise.delegate conversation we had a couple months ago? Yeah, yes. Okay, just, just yeah, being well, clear. Promise delegate is, is, is relevant, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, could I ask a question? Um, I, I'm wondering why, uh, what the purpose of there is compared to just using uh, tilde uh, uh, eventual send kind of syntax, as in what, what, what's the difference between performing an action remotely versus performing it locally? So, yeah. So um, uh, the, the main thing is actually the uh, higher, you know, the, the Dan's atomicity issue appearing again at a higher level, even when you've got um, uh, methods that are designed to be coherent atomic units, you still might want to do a complex operation that is atomic across several of them. So in this example, I want to, I want to add a few exclamation marks to a value that I don't have synchronously available. This is a very contrived example, um, but since I can't perform a lock on it, um, or if I don't want to. And so I could basically just cut the locks out of this library and just preserve the there. And I can now perform uh, yeah, synchronous uh, operations on something that's remote. And in the map case, the same, same thing. If there's multiple values in this remote VAT, I can now perform synchronous looking code. Um, so if it was pipelined, each operation would have to depend on the previous return value. But here, because I have JavaScript, I can I can perform any arbitrary computation on any uh, arbitrary result within the uh, scope. Yeah, uh, the, the hazard with there, uh, and the reason why we haven't uh, uh, implemented it uh, at Agoric uh, and are unlikely to soon, is that it becomes trivial to send an infinite loop. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, um, uh, the uh, there should only be available uh, uh, between VATs when uh, each VAT is willing to, um, uh, to, to execute an infinite loop on behalf of the other VAT. Right. Uh, and sometimes, in particular with, with engineering, we're, we're likely to do around uh, gas, uh, the infinite loops become non-fatal, but it still becomes a very easy way to induce pain. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but it's I mean, very exciting to add metering around something like this. Um, yeah. For sure. sure. I, I, my, uh, I, I, there is very cool uh, for, for sure. I think, and I think that, um, I think it's interesting. I, but I find it much more interesting to be able to send applications into a container that would have that, that have 
that, that are able to, for example, take dependencies. Um, <laughs> because, uh, it, there is very, I, I would say it's cute in comparison to being able to say, um, here's an application I'd like to you run and here are some things I'm going to send to you for you to respond to. Um, uh, because of the uh, because there will never have the ability to, for example, import a module. Well, I guess we didn't talk too much about the uh, the context in which the it's being evaled at. Like you could expose a require function or something. Um, in this design, is it up to the VAT what globals are available? Um, so the the um, uh, so, so in fact, it's up to the VAT because. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, the specification is uh, that uh, you're only supposed to send closed functions and the receiver is supposed to evaluate it in an environment in which the only free variables are the universal globals. Now, this was before there was an import expression, which is a special form, mm. um, uh, but by the philosophy of the original design, uh, I would prohibit the import expression uh, within this function. So, so Chris is right. The, the there is really for, uh, you know, tiny self-contained pieces of code. Uh, but if you think about many of the thens that you write, as well as many of the array maps that you write, a lot of the things that we write that take little functions as arguments, uh, the there lets you do remote forms of those. Um, and as a matter of fact, if you scroll forward a little, Dan, to where we actually look at the map reduced light example. Okay. So this map reduced light, um, uh, this is not this is not map reduce as Google means map reduce. It's map reduce as functional programmers mean map reduce, um, which is a frequent confusion. Um, uh, but basically, um, uh, this function takes a um, uh, an array of elements where the, where, sorry, an array of promises for elements where the elements themselves are, can be anywhere. So basically this is an array of, of potentially remote promises for remote elements. Um, and then it takes a mapper function, which must be a closed function. And it takes a reducer function, which does not need to be a closed function. So it's going to operate only locally. Um, and it assumes that the reducer is associative and commutative so that it can reduce in opportunistic order as answers come back rather than doing a left to right reduce. Mm. Um, and of course, uh, to break symmetry, the reduce has an initial value. Um, uh, so what this does on um, uh, the there that you see um, uh, uh, buried in there, sends the mapper to the element and gets back a promise for the mapped result. And then, uh, so as it does that in the for loop up front, it then does a then on each of those mapped results. And as each of those then things fire, it does that step of reduction, which is therefore reducing it only in opportunistic order as those mapped P promises resolve. Uh, so I thought this is, you know, really a very, very nice little example. Uh, whether it's useful or not, it's, it's certainly in the same area as, as the kind of MapReduce programming that Google does. Uh, just the, the Google MapReduce has a whole bunch of these sort of um, database index kind of logic that's really orthogonal to what I'm showing off here. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's a cool uh, way of composing it into a bigger, uh, more useful function. Well, well uh, I've taken up uh, 45 minutes of the of the last hour. Uh, I know there was some stuff uh, regarding TC39. <laughs> that seems like such an important topic to push to the end. Um, but I just wanted to yield time if any of that could be addressed with the remaining. Alex. But, but yeah, but yeah, this has been great. So thanks so much for everybody's uh, input and feedback. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm not sure I'm able to share my screen. I forgot whether I can or not on this thing. Um, but uh, 
considering we only have about 15 minutes left, there are three stage three proposals that were relevant to this group that I saw. Okay. Um, the only one that's up for immediate discussion in, in two weeks is weak refs. And I think we talked about that a few weeks ago. Right, I think weak refs are fine. Okay. Um, Do we need to prepare anything about weak refs for the next meeting? No, I don't believe so. Okay. Um, the others that, were, that I have called out for stage three are legacy regular expression features, which has been sitting at stage three for more than three years. And I'm kind of wondering why. <laughs> oh, um, the reason is that it's, um, uh, who are the champions on that proposal? One moment, I'll have to open it in a new tab here. Uh, make that two moments. Uh, you and a gentleman by the name of Claude Pache, who I do not know. Right. Okay, so uh, that's what I suspected. Uh, so the answer about why it's been languishing is it's my fault. Um, uh, Claude Posh does not sit on TC39. Uh, he's an outside expert. Uh, he suggested this on uh, ES Discuss, and I, I, I expressed enthusiasm. He wrote up the proposal. I brought it to the committee. Uh, everybody liked it. It advanced until it got, and then I just ran out of energy, um, and I just haven't gotten back to it. It's the, all of the JavaScript engines conform adequately with the proposal that the need I had to ensure conformance is met. Uh, no one's going to deviate from this proposal uh, in a way that's dangerous to us. Uh, and the result was it just never got back to the top of my priority queue. Is somebody presenting it at the upcoming meeting for advancement? No, this is just something, like I said, I saw it had been there forever and I figured. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would like to see it advance. I'm just, it's still not coming up back up to the top of my priority queue, it's way down on my priority queue. Uh, but if anybody else wants to volunteer, I will certainly do what I can to help you out from the side. Okay, okay. Uh, the only other um, stage three proposal that I saw um, was uh, Hashbang Grammar which frankly, now that I remember it, I don't, now that I see it, I don't remember what that was about. I think that's Bradley, Bradley's still here. Yeah, so that's just adding uh, the Octothorpe exclamation point uh, interpreter directive that already exists in a lot of command line applications for JavaScript runners to the official language. Yep. It only adds it at the start position of script and module parse goals. So you can use it within eval. Um, we don't allow anything before that due to concerns about needing to pre-parse uh, ahead of time for some tools. Uh, CSS had a similar problem in the web and there are also concerns about security and the ability to accidentally inject things like a license comment affects how the program runs. What about a function body? Uh, what do you mean? Oh, it's not allowed there. Um, okay. There okay. just wasn't incentive to my knowledge. Uh, okay. the, the ability to put it at the start of a function body seems a little bit weird. I'm just thinking about the function constructor where you're still giving it an ev effectively an evaluable string. Um, it's very program-like, uh, but I'm very happy that you did not um, include function bodies. I think it would be very strange to have it in function bodies, especially once you start to try to explain why it's only allowed at the start, because adding it to a function body makes it seem like it's just a comment. Um, so uh, CJS modules, CJS modules are processed by node by wrapping them in a function header and trailer. 
Oh, CJS has a actually slightly altered grammar. We do pre-processing on source text for CJS. It's not just a function body. Um, including stripping that, we do some stuff with the bomb, the byte order marker, and things of that nature um, okay. that are not strictly in the ECMAScript spec itself. Okay. I see. You inject a byte order marker to ensure that it's it's. Uh... No, we rip it out. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. <laughs> okay. Um, the only other things uh, that's it for stage three stuff. Um, stage two had three things on it: um, collection normalization, which was uh, who was that. That one is me. Um, that one's forever stalled on a bike shed. Like it's, it cannot proceed forward due to arguments about reusability and names. Um, which is unfortunate, but that's the state of the world. Uh, cool. Upsert. Who wanted to talk about upsert today? I'm I'm just saying I was going to add it to the agenda. Um, I think I, we should I think we should defer that for another meeting because that sounds like a much bigger conversation. Well, what is it? Uh, it would insert if missing or update a value in a map. So essentially, uh -huh. it's similar to method is missing. Got it. But for collection types. Okay. I need to step away for a moment. Oh, well, um, let's, uh, uh, let's, let's wrap it up then. Um, I'm going to stop recording.